But look, we had Winston Peters on yesterday, and he was all smiles, but he was saying those polls don't worry about them because that double poll that came out, the TV3 and the TVNZ poll came out, uh, basically showed, yes, there was a dead cat bounce for Labor, neck and neck with National. Uh, Hipkins had done well after the carefully orchestrated transfer of power in uh, the Labor Party. And... <coughs> But that New Zealand First, which had been knocking on the door, I think the last poll of 5% was kind of in the doldrums. Now, Winston, of course, said you can't trust the polls, they're all wrong. Although they do come out right more often than not. Um, and he said he was reinvigorated uh, to fight against, well, anything that Winston and his members want to fight against, but largely uh, co-governance, the idea of two tiers of citizenship in New Zealand, and those are issues and grounds upon which uh, our first guest this morning, I think, has had a fair amount of political success because also in those polls, we see the ACT Party holding steady. Uh, the Greens had gone down a bit because uh, part of the increase in Labor's fortunes had gone, they had come from the Green Party. But ACT seems to have this kind of 10%, pretty solid uh, place in the political firmament right now. Um, what does ACT do in the current situation where I think there's change and clearly Labor have created change by changing leader? Where, where to next uh, for them? To answer that question, we're joined now by the leader of the ACT Party, David Seymour. David, welcome. Uh, how are you? Oh, pretty good, obviously. Um, everyone's been a bit disrupted here in Auckland for the last few days, but uh, we're working through it. And it's amazing how people have come out and helped each other, uh, even when the government's been a few days behind the eight ball. Yeah. Uh, how, how about you personally? Was your place affected? Anyone you knew affected badly? Um, look, just down the just down the street from where I am, people got a metre of water. Uh, so I was OK. Uh, but it just goes to show, you know, people think of Epsom as being kind of flat and you don't look at those little slopes. Uh, then there's people who, you know, have just lost everything. And you see, you go from house to house and you see some people who, um, you know, actually in, after a few days, the insurers have been in, the builders are stripping the jib board, the carpet's gone, the debris's been taken away by a skip and they're good to go. Um, we've got someone else who, you know, had a car with third party insurance, uh, can't use it to get to work um, and just needs someone to take the car away to get clear his driveway now. So. You know, it just kind of depends. It's the old saying there, but for the grace of God, go I. That's a very good report. That's a very good on-the-spot explanation of what's happening. And I've got to say, I don't know that I saw a lot of that from the mainstream media in general. They seemed obsessed by Wayne Brown and kind of tried to blame him for everything. And I don't know, I've looked from, from Wellington and said, what difference would have been knowing there was a state of emergency an hour or two hours earlier. Yeah, look, I think there have been a lot of failings um, and Wayne Brown's media appearance is probably a sort of what not to do um, for, for, for dealing with something like this. But what that means is that all of the attention's gone on to him, uh, where it probably should go some other places. For example, uh, one place, uh, they got flooded uh, on the Friday night. Uh, they told the council that there was gravel all through the drains in their area um, and to their credit the council did actually come and clean it up on Monday night uh, when the Tuesday rain came they got almost no flooding um, in another instance there was some people that got a meter of water uh, through their uh, house um, and um, you know, that, that that was caused by overflows of the stormwater. So the stormwater was actually bringing water to them. Um, now, I just say these things because I know we'll hear people saying, if only New Zealand killed a few more cows, uh, as if we're you know living in the medieval ages, we make a sacrifice, we'll be delivered from the floods. Uh, but the truth is we, we don't need people that blame Wayne Brown. Maybe he's wrong, but that's not going to help. Uh, we don't need people who are going to say, oh, it's climate change, kill a cow. Uh, what we're going to need is people who take a practical approach 
and are actually prepared to dig into the issues, find out what went wrong and what needs to fix it. Uh, and I suspect a lot of it will be drain capacity uh, and drain maintenance. Yeah. Uh, uh, and that's where we're going to need some honesty. Yeah. And that's interesting because drain maintenance is a relatively easy fix, isn't it? Um, is that you can yeah, get the drain and, out. Yeah, and look, it's, it's early days. So I, I think people are going to need to dig in further and come to some conclusions. But what people are telling me is they, you know, people that live in flood-prone areas are actually very aware of their drains um, and they're always trying to get them cleared before something like this happens because there's been you know, several mini floods in some parts over the last couple of years. And um, people are saying, look, you know, when COVID became New Zealand's only priority, according to the government, uh, a lot of the traditional maintenance didn't occur. So, you know, I just think let's dig into it. Let's take a practical approach uh, and let's work out what it's going to take to stop this happening again. Mm. All right, David, let's let's get back to where we kind of started, the polls. Um, are you surprised at Labor's sort of Chris Hipkins bump or was that the minimum you'd expect? Um, not, not really. I mean, I'm, I'm quite excited because I think that uh, Todd Muller, uh, when he became the leader of the National Party, I, I think he got a nine-point bump. So he, he got an even bigger bump, and look how that ended. Um, so, no, I, I don't take a, a lot out of a poll at, at this time of year. Um, but what I would say is that, um, you know, I'm very pleased that ACT, whether we have a good poll or a bad poll or this time of year or another time of year, um, you know, ACT is, is now consistently there and I think we've got a lot of upside because, you know, this election's going to turn into a Chris versus Chris. Um, who's bringing the policy ideas? Mm. Uh, who's saying we need to have a referendum on co-government? Who's mm. saying that we need to start valuing education? I mean, the way Auckland schools got shut at the drop of a hat, it shows how wrong this government's values are. Uh, I believe if kids can go to school, they should go to school. And if there's a bit of risk out there, they should probably still go to school because education is actually the most important long-term investment any country can make. Uh, let's have a discussion about the values that underpin policy. Stop tying people up in red tape and regulation. Actually give people the ability to make progress. Uh, that's what this country was built on. That's why people came all the way out here, uh, not to fill out forms. All right. In terms of policy, and clearly it's become more and more clear, to be honest to me, that this was a carefully stage-managed transition of leader purely for electoral reasons for the Labor Party. This was nothing to do with burnout. This was the upper echelons of the Labor Party was kind of doing what they did back in 2017, um, though Chippy is probably not as saleable um, as Jacinda Ardern was then. And there have been signals sent, David, that there is going to be a change of, of approach on some of the issues that ACT, uh, I, I would say, is making the front running on, issues like the ethno-state, um, one vote for all people or equal democracy for all people. And we've had the cabinet reshuffle. Uh, the danger always is in these situations that it is window dressing, that it's all talk and no turkey. Um, do you believe or do you see signs of serious and real change in some of the issues uh, and some of the policies that ACT has been critical of? Uh, look, I, I'd love to say that because ultimately I'm a New Zealander. I want the government to put in place good policy. Um, but uh, you know, let's be real here. Um, this is the guy who locked a pregnant woman out of the country, had her take refuge with the Taliban, leaked her private information... And apologised to and her, then David, refused, and apologised to her. No, refused to apologise until the courts made his position untenable. And apologised I mean, to her. That's the, that's the kind of person, only because he was made to. Good people apologise when they don't need to and aren't forced to. Um, that's the kind of person you're dealing with. Uh, next issue... Uh, this is the guy who's been responsible for Te Pukenga. He says education is, is his passion, but, you know, attendance is at record lows. This is the guy who was responsible for putting fog cannons uh, in dairies so that people could be safer from ram raids. He had $6 million a year to do it, and he installed seven 
but we couldn't quite get him to admit that in Parliament. So, you know, on character, on policy, it's the same guy that's been responsible uh, for many of... Basically, everything he's been responsible for has been a screw-up, and we haven't even touched COVID in this discussion. Uh, he was the COVID-19 response minister for two years. Uh, so I don't think you're going to see a lot of performance out of him. But as far as is there going to be policy change, well, so far, the only policy change they've announced uh, is to extend an existing Labor policy. That's the fuel tax uh, rebate and road user charge and public transport subsidy. Well, OK, I understand how popular that's going to be. Who doesn't like free money? Yeah, where did but the $715 you, million for that come from, do you think? That's the not question. Mer- not merging Radio New Zealand and Television New Zealand? Well, the astonishing thing is that I'd, I'd love to know how much they've already spent on consultants charging by the hour there. Um, they can't get all of that money back. But here's the, here's the next question. How is it possible that they cannot explain where the money's coming from? I mean, this fuel discount started in March, tw- uh, in March 2022. They've had almost a year to think through how much it costs and where the money comes from that they now can't say, despite it being $700 million. And uh, it's actually that kind of recklessness that's causing inflation. Oil prices uh, have gone down uh, below where they were when this when this policy was introduced. So, you know, once again, you know, there's, there's no new initiative there. The only way to get rid of these policies is to change the government. But here's another thought. I'm not confident the other Chris would change them all either, and that's why I'm in the ACT Party asking people yeah, to give us yeah, the Yeah, and, and look, I'm sorry, my analysis that I have to agree with you, they're both fighting for some sort of weird middle ground. Um, despite that, Chris Hipkins has taken the uh, local government portfolio off Nanaima Hooter and given it to Kieran McNulty. Isn't that an indication that Three Waters, for example, a very contentious policy, might indeed be paused, rolled back, stopped? Well, you've got to hope so. But, I mean, you've know, you got to remember, it, it came out over the weekend when everyone was sort of flood-obsessed media-wise. Um, but there was some very good uh, reporting by Thomas Coughlin and The Herald, and you've got to give these guys credit where it's due, uh, pointing out that Nanaya Mahuta had a secret meeting with the Greens' Eugenie Sage. It wasn't in her ministerial diary. So she's been dodging and ducking questions about how this entrenchment clause, if you think back to the basic attack on New Zealand democracy last year, um, you know, she's never admitted where that came from. Well, it turns out it was a stitch-up. And I would say that, you know, Nanaia Mahuta had to go. What's interesting is she's still representing New Zealand as the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Then you can get to the question uh, of what exactly... Uh, is going to be their policy. They're still going to take the assets, I assume, off councils where ratepayers have paid for them and put them into these new entities. How responsible would Entity A have been uh, during the Auckland floods? Uh, And then they're still going to have some sort of Maori representation, unless they're really going to get rid of that. So it's not obvious what they're going to change. All right, except maybe uh, the shop front dummy, uh, as it were. Um... Yeah, that's why X says, first of all, they steal it, well, repeal it, give the, count, give the assets back to the council so it can be democratically governed, share revenue from central government with locals so they actually can afford to upgrade their infrastructure. And then if two councils want to merge, we're not going to stop them. But I don't think it's Wellington's job uh, to be there forcing people together who don't want to be together. Mm. Look, I want to uh, also highlight a, a comment um, brought to my attention yesterday from Stuart Nash, who I think is the minist- new Minister of Police and Law and Order has been an issue and ram raids have been a big issue in the country. And Stuart Nash suggested that basically if dairy stopped selling cigarettes, that would solve the ram raid uh, problem because cigarettes seem to be one of the products that are targeted. I just wondered what your response to that was. Oh, boy. Um, The purpose of law and order is so that law-abiding people can safely go about their business. Law and order is supposed to enable commerce. Uh, Now we've got a police minister who said, well, we can't uphold law and order, so instead we're going to stop commerce. I mean, it's difficult to really get to the heart of this. And, And this war on smoking is completely wrong. Um, I think government has to do three things around tobacco policy. 
number one, inform people of the dangers. Number two, ensure that people don't end up taking other people's money by using up extra health care or taxes or whatever. And number three, make sure that people don't harm each other by blowing smoke in their faces or whatever. But everyone knows smoking is dangerous. The taxes paid are vastly higher uh, than any health care costs imposed by smoking. Uh, and thirdly, uh, there's already rigorous laws that you can't smoke in someone else's face. And Annex supported the idea that you can't smoke in a car with a kid because that's an innocent party that shouldn't mm. be affected. Um, but, you know, we're there. The government is doing enough. Uh, if people still want to smoke, if dairy owners still want to sell them, then I really don't see uh, why it is that the government feels it needs to take more action and take more tax, other than it's a cash, dra cash grab uh, and it's a control freak uh, move. And of course, part of the reason that COVID was managed so badly is that the public health profession haven't been focused on true public health issues such as epidemics. For the last 20 years, they've been busy lecturing people about private health choices that actually aren't public health at all. Mm. I guess the other thing is, the reason that cigarettes are such a uh, such you know a good target for criminals is because of their value, but in truth, most of that value is tax. Maybe if the government dropped all the excise tax on tobacco, it wouldn't be such an attractive thing to nick. Because at the moment, I think you know well, the tobacco company gets a dollar fifty a a packet. The the you know the retailer gets fifty cents or a dollar, and the rest of it is just tax. Um, I, I, I don't know what the numbers are, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if it was over 90% looking at the excise tax they're taking. I mean, um, that, so that, that's, a, that's a serious problem. And l let me just give you a couple of thoughts. Number one is that the, the government is now the biggest tobacco addicts in New Zealand. I mean, I do know what the number is that they're taking in in tax. It's $2 billion what? Uh, on tobacco tax every year, $2 billion. You go into the government accounts and you look through, I know people say go through line by line. Well, you can do that. Um, it's about $2 billion. It was 2.2 a while back. Uh, it's coming in about 1.8 this year, I think. But you, you, can, you can say it's $2 billion. Um, now, to put that in perspective, that's 10% of the entire health budget and those people pay other taxes for health and education. Well, and so I should so get a medal. I should have it, a, please say enormous. thank you to me because I'm a nicotine addict. I'm helping the country Well, absolutely. Out and, you know, if, you, if you die earlier and claim less, pre less pension, then we'll give you some sort of special posthumous honour as well. Um, and the, the thing is that, you know, and I'm, I know I'm, not, I'm kidding, but, you know, yeah, actually yeah, that's why it's true. smoking doesn't harm others. Yeah. But uh, let me just tell you one other thing about that from talking to the dairy owners and so on. Um, when nicotine or cigarettes get stolen, the dairy owner has already paid the tax. What? So, yep. So, so the dairy owner is out of pocket. They they pay the tax when they buy the product. Uh, so it's not as though they sell a bunch of cigarettes and pay their tax later. Uh, and and so this this is why I say the government's the biggest nicotine and uh, uh, um, addicts. Yeah. It's two billion dollars, and they get the dairy owners to collect them. The dairy owners get bashed up by people trying to steal the cigarettes, but really steal or the killed. tax. Or indeed killed. Yep. Yeah. Well, in one case, yes, yeah. uh, and um, and and then uh, to add insult to injury, um, the, the, they're now saying, well, it's not safe to police the society while you're doing that, um, so we're just going to stop it. And and I just I, I wonder uh, if Grant Robertson might have something to say to um, uh, 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 Stuart Nash because uh, Grant Robertson will be thinking, gee, I just just spent seven hundred and eighteen million on. The fuel subsidies that I can't afford. Um, where am I going to get two billion if you ban selling cigarettes? All right. Um, look, the other issue. It is a long weekend coming up. It's the, that time of the year when every weekend seems to be an anniversary of this or a holiday for that. Uh, it is Waitangi weekend. Um, it seems a crazy way always to me to start the year with this bone of contention as it's become. What do you are you doing for Waitangi Day, and what does Waitangi Day mean to you? Um, well, first of all, I'll, I'll be up there at Waitangi on uh, Sunday. I, I think it's important that, you know, our elected representative, um, it is a major historically significant time. Uh, so it's a little bit like, you know, always at the 
Auckland Museum for Anzac Day. I'll be up at the treaty grounds uh, for Waitangi um, and I'll be giving a speech at the Pofuri there and, and doing the usual stuff. Um, I think that's important to do because, you know, it's people who show up that make the decisions and make the change and ACT will certainly be there putting its perspective on what the treaty should mean. Uh, we're very focused on the fact that, you know, it's said we all have the same rights and duties. That's what needs to be... What uh, sort of reception there. are you going to get, do you think, David? You must... You must, as a politician, approach doing that with some sense of trepidation or caution. Yes and no. I mean, what I can tell people is that um, while the media always focus on the negatives, it generally is quite a warm uh, and positive atmosphere up there. Uh, so, no, look, I'm happy to, to be there and, of course, my background um, is Ngāpuhi, so, you know, I'm, I'm part of the local people and even though I don't really have any, um, you know, practical day-to-day -day associations, they're always very respectful of that and very welcoming to me, so I'm grateful for that. So You, know, you it's not get all treated negative. differently because of your ancestry. Isn't that a terrible thing? Well, I... <laughs> I agree with that, but you know, at the same time, you know, that, those are the facts. And um, mm. if you ask what's the reception like, that's how they behave, and, mm. and I'm not going to, um, you know, refuse to be uh, treated well on principle. So that's the first yeah. issue. Uh, the second issue you said is, you know, what does it mean to you? Mm. Um, and look, I think it actually is a very special thing because the Treaty of Waitangi, you know, a document that says you got a one government. You know, you've got a right to self-determination and property rights and you've got the same rights and duties. It's probably the best foundation of a country uh, that's ever been done. And it was a voluntary agreement too. So there's a lot of positive in there. Now, we're not opposed to Waitangi. We're not opposed to the Treaty of Waitangi. I actually think it was a good start. Uh, what we're opposed to is the endless elites, both Maori and non-Maori, who have jumped on the gravy train and decided that this document somehow means a partnership where people should be treated, as you say, differently uh, based on their ancestry. And I think that is completely wrong. Um, that is inconsistent with the principles of a liberal democracy. And so, you know, the, the, the argument, I think people say, oh, throw away the treaty and it's a simple nullity and whatever. Um, actually, no, I think that it is the foundation of the country. It's a very good foundation. It's up to people who believe in universal human rights and liberal democracy. It's up to us to show up and make the case that that's what it's about. Uh, and that's exactly what I'll be doing. Right. And final question, did you get an invite to Shane Jones' party on Saturday? I hope not, um, and if I did, I hope it got lost. I just can't abide uh, people that behave the way that, that he did. Um, you know, anyone that doles out taxpayer money and then gets five grand put in their campaign bank account, um, yeah, I, I don't think that that's the kind of person I'd want to go to the party of. All right, I am. Oh, I don't know. I've gotten the invite yesterday. David, thank you very much indeed for your time. Uh, happy long weekend. Uh, to yeah. you, and I hope all goes well at, at Waitangi uh, on Monday. Me too. Thanks <laughs> that, for having me on the show. That is the leader of the ACT Party, David Seymour. Some interesting views there. Oh, he was hard on Chippy. He is not stepping back. That is game on. Hard on New Zealand first too. We'll have more on that.